Well, thanks very much, David. Thanks to TASC for the work that you do in campaigning for a more equal, more democratic Ireland. And thanks to everyone at the Foundation for European Progressive Studies for co-organising this event. Uh, and thanks to everyone for providing me with the day's respite and refuge away from the battlefields of Westminster. Uh, Britain's government now is, of course, run by a majority Conservative government, or as they like to call themselves, the Workers' Party. <laughs> no ideological relationship with the Workers' Party of these shores, of course, or indeed with any Workers' Party anywhere. Uh, it's been a pretty tough few weeks following that general election in the UK. In the run-up to the election, all of the pollsters had pred predicted that we would see a Labour-led coalition. So on election night at 10 o'clock, when the exit polls were broadcast, many people were in a state of shock. I think it was uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, sometimes called the famous Irish-American boxer, who once, who once said, the knockout punch is always the one you never saw coming. Um, I've been asked to talk today about what we can do as democratic socialists, as trade unionists, to turn back the tide and to build a fairer, more equal society. And first of all, I want to start on a positive note by offering my sincere congratulations uh, to you all on the referendum result on equal marriage rights. Yeah. And also to congratulate the Irish Congress and others for organising a spectacular rally in Belfast to see that right extended to the north. As one report I read commented, it was a wonderful thing to witness a march that was not just about equality, but about love too. Um, I believe that the greater goal of equality, not just of wealth and income, but in all its many manifestations, is the single most important challenge facing us in the UK, in Ireland, in Europe, and around the world. Now, at one point, it almost seemed as if some of the elite agreed with us. Uh, I've attended the World Economic Forum in Davos twice, both times as a member of a small but spirited band of delegates uh, from the international trade union body, the ITUC. Now, the World Forum is, of course, held in a small, picturesque village in the Swiss mountains, full of ski chalets and twinkly lights, a kind of butlins for the rich. Um, and on my, first, on my first visit, it seemed that everybody was talking about tackling inequality as a top priority. Now, admittedly, the prescriptions on offer, such as more skills, more training, did not exactly seem up to the scale of the challenge, but at least there seemed to be widespread recognition that somebody had messed up in a big way, and this time it couldn't be blamed on the unions. At my second meeting this year, the mood music was some, somewhat different. There was encouragement from global business leaders to move on. Uh, as if Davos was offering group therapy for the recently divorced or bereaved. This view was echoed subsequently in a Wall Street Journal article by the world's third wealthiest man, Warren Buffett, when he said, quote, people should stop blaming the rich for inequality. Presumably we should start blaming the poor. <laughs> now, now, of course, those gathered at Davos are generally more experienced in basking in success, not failure. And given that the picture on inequality had not improved one iota since it was last discussed, I suspect that there was little appetite for lingering on what has almost, in those circles, become a taboo subject, let alone for taking any personal responsibility. On the contrary, the conversation had moved on to new pastures, notably the risk of a Greek exit from the Eurozone and the problem of corruption. Needless to say, in that forum, <coughs> it was talked about uh, in terms of the political variety rather than the banking and corporate kind. In fact, one of the most disturbing views 
I heard expressed was that, quote, it is better to have no democracy and good governments than democracy and bad governments. Uh, that actually sent a chill up my spine when I heard it. This comment perhaps serves as a reminder that extreme inequality necessitates growing authoritarianism, something that we saw writ large in the Troika's treatment of the program countries, and that we are seeing emerge in many other countries too, including Britain, where there is a fundamental attack on union rights underway, uh, including the right to strike. And I think in this uh, post, if you like, Edward Snowden world, it's important to see that this is also <coughs> the way uh, in the UK context to state surveillance of union organisers, a threat not just to unions, but to the civil liberties of everyone. It seems that the argument that inequality is ultimately bad for our economies and therefore business has not yet penetrated the consciousness of the new finance captains of capital, although there is scope, perhaps, for tactical alliances with businesses in the real economy. John F. Kennedy once observed that if a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. But the 85 wealthiest people in the world who Oxfam identified as having more wealth between them than the 3.5 billion poorest don't yet seem overly concerned. Now, according to Oxfam, very soon, the top 1% will earn as much wealth between them as the other 99%. This is inequality at its most dangerous, unfair, extreme, unsustainable. And in many ways, Britain is a prime example we were the only G7 country to see inequality rise between 2000 and 2014. According to the Sunday Times Rich List, while workers have seen their living standards tank, the longest squeeze on living standards since Victorian times, the wealth of the richest 1,000 families more than doubled. This is not the promised trickle down of wealth that we were told about but in fact an industrial scale hoovering up, whereby those at the top not only ever take ever bigger pay packages compared to the rest, but they take a greater share of the total wealth produced too. In many ways, Britain today is a nation of contrasts. We have food banks and we have Michelin star, star restaurants, payday lenders and how to spend its supplements benefit cuts for the working poor, and tax cuts for the idle rich. In London, young, even young professionals have no chance of getting themselves even a basement flat. But if you go to the likes of Kensington and Chelsea, you'll see that those residents are building an entirely new subterranean world underneath their houses of private car parks, cinemas, and swimming pools. Well, of course, with the majority uh, Conservative government elected for the first time in 23 years, promising to shrink the state back to levels not seen since the 1930s, inequality looks set to get a whole lot worse. And here in Ireland, of course, you face uh, many of the same problems. You have the worst gross market income inequality of the OECD countries, one of the lowest corporate tax rates in the EU, and some of the patchiest public services, notably in childcare, preschool education, and some aspects of healthcare. Yet as writers like Kate uh, Pickett and Richard Wilkinson have demonstrated, rising inequality not only means worse outcomes for health, education, well-being, uh, mental health, and crime, it delivers profound economic costs too, the so-called inefficiency of inequality. Not just the significant impact on growth, with the OECD calculating that the British economy would have been 20% 20 20 bigger had the gap between rich and poor not widened since the 1980s, but also the role of inequality in precipitating economic crises 
in the first place. As leading economists have recognized, it was that uh, confluence of stagnant wages, spiraling debt, subprime mortgages, and reckless financial speculation that took us in the UK to the verge of cash machines being closed down. Now, many agree that the primary cause of the global financial crisis was the growing wealth gap between a tiny financial elite and everybody else, with ordinary workers forced to borrow just to maintain living standards, while a banking and finance elite traded and gambled in what a former director of the UK business organisation, the CPI, called socially useless products. Now, while the Davos campers may be engaged in mass amnesia, keen to return to business as usual, the reality is that this financialized model of capitalism <coughs> is inherently unstable and destructive. And next time it crashes, the consequences could be a whole lot worse. Of course, the crash didn't mean that we had somehow run out of money. The question was, who had a hold of it. But achieving a redistribution of wealth requires a redistribution of power. In the UK, the election of a Labour government had seemed like an essential step towards challenging the neoliberal status quo. Yet many voters appeared to vote against their own economic and political self-interest. That surprise defeat in the UK left many people scratching their heads as to exactly what had gone wrong. Luckily, before the week was even out, Tony Blair popped up on our TV screens <laughs> to give us the answer. Apparently, Labour had lost because it was too left-wing. Now, in my view, he was wrong. Any Labour manifesto worthy of the name should be about creating decent jobs, building homes, and protecting our NHS. Of course, in the wake of the defeat, there was always going to be a political battle to write the story as to why. But at the TUC, we decided we wanted to look at the evidence <coughs> first. So we commissioned research before the election to be carried out just after to find out why people had voted the way that they did. The answer was complicated. Uh, but, I suspect, not peculiar to Britain. Economic trust and competence was the number one issue. Why, in my view, Labour's admission that it, when it had been in government it had been too soft on banking regulation came far too late. And without that admission, the Tories mantra that the crash was Labour's mess stuck. And Labour never really countered the Tories' obsession with deficit reduction with a convincing alternative account of the need for investment and higher wages to achieve fair growth. Nationalism, both Scottish and English, also played a big role. The Tories pretty shamelessly played on fears of a Labour minority government propped up by Scottish Nationalist Party MPs precisely because all their focus groups told them it worked. If the SNP slogan was put Scotland first, then it should come as no surprise that some people in England worried that that meant that they would be put second. And in time-honoured fashion, migration and welfare were blamed for pressures on pay and public services. Now, Labour scored much better than the Tories for being seen to be on the side of working people. But if you want the honest truth, in my view, I think the sad truth is that too many working people don't feel that anyone is really on their side. Now, since the election, uh, as you would expect, I've been gallivanting around the country, talking to groups of workers and union representatives. Uh, but I was struck by the comments of a man in his 50s uh, from one of our northern towns. Now, he just uh, told me that when he went to his local pub, he never 
ever saw anybody from the Labour Party there, and nobody ever really talked about trade unions. Now, I'm not advocating a nationwide pub crawl, uh, not yet anyway, I may come to that, but I suspect that Britain isn't the only place where working class communities feel abandoned by politicians and neglected by trade unions. And as nationalists peddling easy, folksy, or romantic solutions to people's problems have shown, if we don't fill that space, then there are plenty of others who will. But the right, according to our polls and research, can't relax either. Our survey did not provide a ringing endorsement for them. Now, some have tried to argue that Labour lost because Labour was seen as too business bashing. Well, our evidence shows, on the contrary, uh, on the contrary, there is continuing and simmering anger about big business and the banks, with most people continuing to feel ripped off and wanting tougher controls. Attitudes on Labour's policies to crack down on greed at the top, corporate tax dodging, and indeed inequality were similarly progressive, which is a relief because the TUC and unions campaigned for them. So despite its detractors, Ed Miliband's most important insight that we must deal with the root causes of inequality and not just its symptoms holds good. However, one of the key challenges that we face in Britain is how to translate that intellectual battle of ideas into language that has meaning for people's real lives. I think one of the answers, just one, but one of them, is to start returning to the value of work, the dignity of labour, and the importance of voice. I am fascinated uh, by the language uh, around wealth creation that is current in the UK. Entrepreneurs are almost universally described as the sole wealth creators, including by some Labour politicians who, in my view, should know better. It's as if wealth was only created in the boardroom and that workers, Labour, had nothing to do with it. We need to find ways to remind people how wealth is really created in the economy because that will help build workers' sense of entitlement to a voice in its distribution. And I'm not just talking about wages, although it's true that collective bargaining remains one of the most effective forms of redistribution of wealth that we know. And by the way, a great credit is due to the Irish Congress for the progress that's been made on their proposals to extend collective bargaining and so to begin to rebalance wealth and power in the workplace. But I'm also talking about workers' right to a voice on investment, on productivity, on the future direction of the companies that they work for. As I often say, nobody has a greater interest in the long-term success of a company than those whose livelihoods depend on it. Britain is now in a minority of EU countries where workers are excluded from the boardroom. Ending that lockout is not just an end in itself, but I hope could be one step in a journey of broader economic democratisation, the development of economic citizenship that in turn can help challenge working people's sense of powerlessness. We certainly do need to frame a new economic settlement, what the Irish uh, President Michael D. Higgins has rightly called an ethical economy. After the crash, there was a sense that that neoliberal model had crashed and burned, that a paradigm shift was the next logical step, but it didn't quite turn out that way. Free market capitalism has proved to be very, very resilient. But we do need to hold out a positive vision and alternative to the financial and property speculation that landed both the UK and Ireland in such an almighty mess. And we need to make it real, starting with industrial strategies which place good, greener jobs and high quality vocational training at their heart. 
That means not only addressing people's desire for the kind of skilled, secure jobs that you can actually build a life on, but providing space and encouragement for working people to use their intelligence and their creativity to develop ideas about what they and their companies and their industries actually make and do. The groundbreaking agreement reached by our own Communication Workers Union in the run-up to privatisation of Royal Mail as included at the unions, um, as part of that union's demand, uh, establishing a joint management union growth forum. And the union has used that forum to outline proposals for injecting a community dimension to the company's business plan, so creating community value <coughs> as well as shareholder profit. We also need to take on the element that state and public services are a drain on wealth creation rather than a necessary precondition for it. Not just in ensuring that workers are healthy, trained and educated and can get to work, but we also know that state investment in science, for example, has provided many of the innovations and technology, including from the US, uh, the internet, that company success <coughs> relies on. And without high quality, affordable childcare and care for the elderly and disabled, much of the modern workforce, particularly women, cannot even contemplate getting a job in the first place. In the UK, I'm also proud that the TUC has led the debate for fair taxation, calling for an end to the scandal of non dom status, for a war on that £25 billion worth of tax avoidance, and for a Robin Hood tax on financial transactions, raising potentially billions for the public purse and putting a break on excessive speculation in the city. But capital is increasingly transnational and labor must be too. And that's why a second key priority must be to address the future of social Europe, ensuring that the EU once again becomes a motor of progressive social and economic change. Where once the EU was a greater force for equality, its current policy agenda is making our continent more divided and more unequal. In different ways, right across Europe, from Dublin to Athens, and Madrid to London, working people are increasingly questioning the legitimacy of a European political class that seems out of touch and in hoc to the interests of global finance and large corporations. And the progress of that transatlantic trade agreement, TTIP, will be one key test of that. Back in 2012, Eurobarometer, which measures public attitudes across the continent, found that for the first time ever, European citizens considered the EU to be, uh, more European citizens considered the EU to be undemocratic than democratic. And we've now reached a crunch point. The situation in Greece is now approaching its climax with potentially far reaching consequences for the rest of Europe. Meanwhile in the UK, our complex relationship with Europe is entering a new and dangerous phase with a referendum on our membership set to take place within the next couple of years. Now, David Cameron has already signalled that elements of the social chapter would be up for renegotiation ahead of that referendum. But he has refused to come clean about exactly which workers' rights, paid holidays, health and safety, fair treatment for agency of part-time workers, he has in mind. Now, luckily for us, um, others have been somewhat more forthcoming and we know there is a lobby for weakening rights on working time, on equal treatment for agency workers and a moratorium on any new workers' rights coming forward. Yet, making working lives worse will almost certainly increase the likelihood of a British exit. According to a TUC poll of 4,000 workers, 55% would be more supportive of Britain's membership of the EU if it did more to help working people get decent pay, rights and conditions. 
and across the EU, I believe that it's pretty much the same story. Now, of course, we understand that the EU has to be competitive in a global economy, but that cannot and must not be delivered by dismantling Europe's defining achievement, its distinct and popular social model. We urgently need to refresh and renew that bargain that has held our continent together since the 1950s. For sure, a single market on the one hand but counterbalanced on the other by good public services, strong workplace rights, and an equal voice for unions at the social partnership table. We need a Europe run not just for business, but for workers and citizens too. One thing is clear, if the EU is about little more than protecting the single currency at all costs, privatizing our services, and keeping a tight lid on public spending, then popular support for the European ideal will wither on the vine. So, so now is not the time to reject the need for a political voice, but to rebuild it. And we can only do that if we renew the ranks of organised labour. And this takes me on to what is the third and final priority, to build stronger unions and to uh, extend our influence. Because as economic history has consistently shown, when workers are organised, labour markets are fairer, the distribution of reward is more even, and societies are more equal. In the mid-70s, when union power was strong in the UK, two-thirds of our GDP ended up in workers' pay packets. Fast forward four decades, and now it's barely more than half. The inevitable consequence of Thatcherism and its sequel, systematic attacks on labour rights and growing casualisation at work. Across much of the industrialised world, it's become a familiar story as neoliberal ideology has spread. Deregulated labour markets, greater freedoms for business and attacks on unions. Now, whether it's union representation on company top pay committees and boards, new sectoral pay bargaining arrangements bringing unions, employers and government together, or new rights to bargain collectively, especially in areas such as skills, there's plenty more that could be done to rebalance that employment relationship. But it's still not yet clear whether there will be a new wave of mass trade unionism. And if so, where will it come from? The growing global middle class or the great masses of the precarious working poor? And if we are to see a revival of trade unionism, then I would also say it demands some changes in the mindset of our own trade union corridors of power too. We are in the midst of what I believe to be a period of transition in many countries, faith in the political class is running low, and that places a special responsibility on trade unions, community campaigners, and social movements to fill that space and create the conditions for renewal. Young people in particular are searching for a sense of identity, for pride, and a sense of belonging. In the UK as elsewhere, they're much more likely to be stuck in low-paid and insecure job, often zero hours, saddled with student debt and excluded from the housing market. But as we saw last year uh, with what I think was a magnificent uh, campaign from the cinema workers in Brixton, who took 13-day strike action in their campaign for a living wage, I believe that this is a generation with a lot of courage and little to lose. At the TUC, we're working on a major new initiative to reach out and organize them from baristas to fast food workers. It will take time because we're putting efforts into preparing it and planning it, but it will happen over the next few years. But it can't just be a case of uh, come and join our club. Capital has changed and so must we. As business models and workforces become more fragmented and dispersed, 
we have to think hard about whether traditional models of recognition and collective bargaining work with these great masses of workers who don't seem to have a hope of either currently. And whether also whether our traditional models of union structures reflect the way that this network generation of young workers live and work. With union resources under pressure, we have to look at helping young workers to organise themselves. Um, with the backing of their families, for sure, from communities, um, and where necessary, shaming companies and using public pressure. Where employers won't even contemplate letting a union through the door, perhaps collective bargaining will have to become citizen bargaining. There are plenty of lessons to learn from around the world, from young people organising a mass movement for change in Spain, to those fast food workers' strikes in the United States, to the bus workers' action in Brazil. So just to end, I'm not going to pretend that this drive for greater equality will be a short campaign, or that our progress will be easy. Certainly in the UK, we have to relearn the art of alliance building, making new friends, not just our existing friends, but also looking to uh, confuse our enemies. We're intent on intelligent campaigning, smart organisation, that is focused on results. But what I am clear about is that unions can't do it on their own, social movements can't do it on their own, and left politicians can't do it on their own. But here's the thing, we can and must do it together. Thank you. indeed Francis for a very wide ranging and informative speech. I think it, it uh, serves to set the context very well for the next session which we will have which is on wage uh, growth as a means to reduce inequalities in Europe. But there might be a couple of questions maybe that people would have if that's all right. We'll just take two or three because we're kind of behind time as usual. So just let the uh, John, I, I'd like to expand a bit on your uh, attitude today. And particularly with reference to this morning speaker, uh, Ruth's uh, Campbell, who referred to the cost to that the fines have affected Canada, uh, not Mexico, as we thought originally. So uh, uh, is the TUC uh, organizing, uh, uh, fear, is there fears at this point in time, or what's, how, how is the TUC and how could we uh, combine uh, to highlight the problems and to do something about it? Thanks very much indeed, gentlemen. Uh, Francis, I think a very brilliant speech. Uh, it's just uh, one area I'd like to get a comment from you on is in terms of in general in, in society in the UK and here, and uh, particularly in the generation campaign. Would you give a comment on the media and the role of the media in the formation of public opinion and the talk about the neoliberal agenda and the whole thing there? Thank you. Thank you indeed. I just want to follow up on that TTIP comment. Uh, I first became aware of TTIP in Germany two years ago, where I became aware that there was very active, uh, very active resistance to it among uh, a lot of Germans, uh, at, as far as I could see, a lot of levels. And I'm wondering, is that uh, reciprocated in the UK? Is there is there considerable suspicion? Of, uh, and the suspicion that I understood in Germany was based on precisely the, the, um, the threat that TTIP posed to, let's call it simply the, the German model of doing things. And I'm just wondering, has that been picked up in the UK? Okay, thanks very much indeed. Francis, would you uh, just, just very briefly on TTIP, this, this is a big campaign uh, for the trade union movement in Britain, but in Europe too. And um, I think increasingly, the, uh, we started off, there are different views, I should say, for sure, but we started off um, hopeful that, uh, you know, we're not against trade, we're for fair trade. Uh, and if there are jobs and investment to be secured, then that's, that's all for the good. 
but we became increasingly concerned about this investor state dispute uh, settlement mechanism, which is effectively uh, provides a privileged position for corporations to sue democratically elected governments, as we've seen, and people have got lots of examples from uh, uh, the issue of plain packaging on cigarettes to um, uh, Viola uh, suing Egypt uh, for increasing the minimum wage and claiming it had damaged their profits. I mean, causes us a bit of a concern. Um, secondly, uh, we became concerned that in terms of the uh, industries that have been identified, that this could pave the way to privatization of public services, or more specifically, make it very hard to take them back. So at the time when we hoped we might see a at least a Labour-led government, and there was a commitment to bring parts of our railway system back, or it could have been service parts of the NHS that had been outsourced or privatized, that this would create a chilling effect because governments would be worried they'd be sued and that would become the excuse for not doing it. And thirdly, and this is a basic point, if we're going to have a trade agreement, or any agreement, what's in it for workers? Isn't it about time that we started asking, uh, what about labour standards? How is it going to protect and support workers' living standards and rights? And again, I'm afraid it's... Uh, 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 inadequate on that front. Um, we are closely coordinating with the German unions, but uh, unions across the EU on this and trying to put pressure on. And obviously, it's all, um, they've delayed the report you may have seen in the parliament. So I think they're feeling under pressure. Um, and that, you know, one last thing is that we, we were told this, we keep being told it's going to be great for jobs and investment. Again, I don't know what the position is here, but uh, in Britain, when you actually look at the reports, according to a government commissioned independent report, the total impact would be neutral. Not a great selling point. So anyway, there's a lot of work to do on that front. Um, in terms of the role of the media in the general election campaign, um, I was trying to think what I could say that would be <laughs> polite. Um, but there is a very, very serious problem in the UK where the ownership of the media has become so concentrated, and frankly, the British uh, Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, so cowed and bullied uh, that there is very, very little uh, diversity uh, in our media. And uh, many of you will be aware that it, I mean, it, it demonized uh, Ed Miliband personally in, in an unprecedented way. I mean, it made Michael Foote and Neil Kinnock look like they'd go off lightly. Um, but it also demonized union leaders and unions and the union link with Labour. Um, it's made, you know, it's no point in us kind of sitting here moaning about it. And we've been trying to find alternative ways to get to people, big users nowadays of social media and all the rest of it. Uh, but when you're faced with that kind of deluge, day in, day out, and when we were campaigning, we were very conscious that, you know, there were telephone operations and all the rest of it, telephone banking. People often said they would, when you asked them what they were worried about, they would quote back to you what they had read in their newspaper, that latest day's headline, without really being aware of it. That they were, you know, so it's quite, it is pernicious. Now, clearly not all Sun readers believe everything they read in the Sun, but I don't think we can just dismiss the power of the media as some have tried to do, because it clearly had a very, very big impact. Francis, thanks very much indeed. Uh, thank you for your contribution and thank you, you know, for taking so much time and trouble to come from London to be with us this afternoon. And as I said earlier on, I think your remarks could form a very good background for the next uh, session, which will be chaired by my colleague Paula Tansy. And